Hello, I'm Barry Daniel, and this is the podcast of the Middle Way Society. Our aim is to encourage a universal approach to living a more integrated, ethical life, avoiding dogma or any appeal to authority. My guest today is Stephen Farrar, who is the Senior Lecturer at the Centre for Applied Jungian Studies in Johannesburg, South Africa. He became passionate about Jungian psychology after experiencing it as radically life-changing when he first encountered it in the late 90s. Stephen's interests are consciousness, meaning and the individuation project. He has a BA Honours degree in philosophy from the University of Witwatersrand and a master's degree in Jungian and post-Jungian studies from the Centre of Psychoanalytic Studies at the University of Essex in the UK. He's here to talk to us today about Carl Jung, Jungian psychology, its relevance today, how we can apply it and how it might relate to the Middle Way. Hello Stephen, welcome to the Middle Way Society podcast. Thank you very much Barry, thank you for inviting me. Okay, well, could we begin, Stephen, by you maybe telling us something of your background and how you first became interested in Carl Jung and Jungian psychology? Barry, I came to it through a fairly unusual uh, series of events, I would say. Yeah. Uh, my background uh, was not in psychology. Um, I was not practicing as a psychologist and I didn't have any particular interest in psychology. And what happened to me, this is around about the year 1999, just before the uh, millennium. I was at a particularly low point in my life, and uh, circumstances led me to a school in Johannesburg that was offering Jungian studies uh, in a very unconventional fashion, in a, in a fashion that was not aimed specifically at clinicians, although there were clinicians that attended. Yeah. But it was aimed at the general public as a way of disseminating uh, Jung's collected works. And I came to this, I came to this encounter at a time that uh, I was <laughs> badly in need of some guidance. It was sort of a low point in my life. And um, I studied with a man by the name of Martin de Chatillon, who has sadly passed away about two years ago, but who had who ran the school in Johannesburg for about 25 years. Okay. And um, I studied with him for about five or six years, and it was um, it had a massive impact on me, and it was certainly life, a life changing experience for me. And it's it's become a it's ultimately become a lifelong passion and now a vocation. Okay. And how was it life changing? How did your life change through the, the engagement with with his work? It it gave me a language. Um, it gave me a language. Jungian. A, psychology, Jungian studies, whatever, the collected works, Jung's work, gave me a language in which, with which to interpret my inner experience, um, what I was dealing with, what I was grappling with, and also the world as well. It, helped me to under, it gave me a language with which to understand both the world, my interpersonal encounters, but I suppose most importantly, most significantly, my own intra-psychic experiences. And using this language, I was able to reframe my identity and reframe my experience and ultimately reframe my life. Great. Okay, well, we can we can explore some of those avenues as we move on into the talk. But um, maybe for those listeners who don't know much about Jung, um, could you tell us a, um, a little bit about him? Sure. Carl Gustav Jung, born in 1875, um, died in 1961. A Swiss psychiatrist and psychologist, and uh, a very early and very enthusiastic adopter of uh, psych- and the psychoanalytic approach, um, very heavily influenced by Freud, not only Freud, other, other people working with sort of a depth psychological approach, but most significantly Freud, um, who then went on uh, later on to break with Freud and to form his own school of depth psychology. Um, which was originally known, was originally uh, named complex psychology, very briefly, but it was named complex psychology, which was later on then changed to analytical psychology, but is most commonly referred to simply as Jungian psychology. Yeah. And this has become a, it's become a, a global movement. Um, he is one of the founding fathers of depth psychology. And uh, I would say perhaps second only to Freud in terms of the influence he's had in the depth psychological field. Mm-hmm. 
um, and uh, continues to be widely practiced uh, throughout the world today uh, by Jungian analysts. And in the last sort of 20 years or so, as a sort of a, a method or a lens, uh, you know, applied to cultural studies, critical theory, that sort of thing as well. Okay. You mentioned that, um, you know, he was very influenced by Freud, but he, he moved on from him. In what, why did he do that? In what ways did he do that? Well, the relationship between Freud and Jung was, was very close. Um, Jung was the, uh, the heir apparent to the psychoanalytic legacy, so appointed by Freud himself. And, uh, and during the, the years of their association, uh, roughly from about 1906, 1907 to around about 1912, 1913, um, they had a very, very close relationship. Uh, they, they exchanged a significant amount of correspondence in addition to their personal encounters. Their correspondence has subsequently been published. Um, but ultimately, theoretically at least, the, the point of departure was Jung's Discovery, if I can refer to it that way, of the collective unconscious, this notion that there's this uh, collective, objective, impersonal, psychic substrate that cannot be traced back to the developmental history of the subject. And his exploration of mythology and mythological motifs and the idea that these had a significant impact and influence on our psychology saw him part ways with Freud's Theory, which really f focused on the uh, the drives and theory of libido, and specifically the Oedipal complex, and this became a, a theoretical point of departure. Uh, Freud um, saw Jung as as uh, perhaps going outside of the classical psychoanalytic approach. He, he sort of criticised him as being somewhat mystical in his approach, and ultimately it led to a, f a very or a, yeah, fairly acrimonious split between the two men. But, but if one studies the history of their relationship, and there's been, there's been a significant study done on this, uh, it wasn't only theoretical. There was, a, there was perhaps personal factors involved as well. This was a very intense and close relationship, and uh, somehow the glass broke at some point between the two of them. So it, it, there was conceptual and theoretical differences, but, but I would say there were some personal issues involved as well. So it was Freud's assumptions about materialism and, and as you say, and his reduction of desire to sexuality that uh, he, he had difficulty with. Yeah, Freud, Freud, of course, had the sexual drive, the sexual instinct as the primary uh, human driver. And um, his theoretical edifice was, was principally built around that. Jung accepted that in principle. He, he accepted the notion of sexuality as being a very, very significant human driver a significant factor in motivation in human action. He, accept, he largely accepted Freud's theories, but he wasn't happy that it was exclusive. He felt that, that the exclusivity that Freud attached to sexuality and to the sexual instinct was uh, an overstatement of the position and that uh, our psychology had other significant drivers and themes playing out, not only the sexual one. Yeah, and doesn't that also in some ways highlight a difference between the two that arguably Jung was more provisional in his outlook, whereas Freud tended to form his views in often quite absolute terms. Yes, I think that would be a fair statement. And I think that's borne out by uh, the research that's been done into their split and, and, and their positions. Okay. Um, to what degree do you think Jung's contribution is philosophical, you know, to the extent that he offered us new and helpful ways of understanding and assessing our beliefs and the ways we interpret experience? It's a big, it's a big question. Yeah. Uh, it's a big question. There, there's some debate on this amongst Jungian scholars whether, whether, whether Jung can be regarded as a philosopher and offering some sort of philosophical approach, not only as a psychologist. Um, in terms of classical or recognized philosophical approaches, his approach would probably be that of Phenomenology, a very yeah. well-known uh, Jungian scholar um, from South Africa, interestingly enough, by the name of Dr. Roger Brook, uh, wrote a text on this, Jung as a phenomenologist, and described Jung's approach as essentially phenomenological, which does seem to be uh, uh, convergent with and consistent with Jung's own description of his position. He often uses this, this word, this idea, he describes himself as using a phenomenological approach. But I think to, to your broader question, um, 
did, did he offer us some sort of philosophy? I would, uh, my, my personal position is that he did, in that he recognized the centrality of the psyche and the, the role of the psyche in the development of any philosophical approach and in terms of the tool that the philosopher uses in the development of his philosophical theories. So this notion that, that everything starts with psyche, that psyche cannot be uh, surgically removed from any abstracted philosophical treatise because ultimately it is a product of psyche. So, so I, think, I think this idea is, is, does have philosophical value. I don't think that Jung is exclusive in this approach, but he certainly helps us to understand how the psyche uh, and how the unconscious um, plays out into all our value systems, all our belief systems. And this word you used earlier on of provisional, that, that perhaps one has to be careful of being too absolute, too certain in any approach, uh, simply because of uh, the fact that it's always difficult to know what role the unconscious plays. There's a conscious element, but there's always an unconscious unknown element. And so one should be weary. There's a particular line I can quote for you that's quite nice. Go from Jung, he says, I, for my part, uh, prefer the precious gift of doubt so as not to violate the virginity of things beyond our ken. Which I always like. I was just, that's a nice, nice line in terms of summing up. That's fantastic. And, and just in relation to this, Jung saw himself very much as a man of science. And science is very much linked with the idea of provisionality and, you know, having a theory and trying to falsify it and then your theory becomes better through that, through that exposure to experience. Um, to what degree did this, this position uh, lead to a gen, genuine opt objectivity of approach from, from Jung, do you think? The truth is, Barry, I don't know. Um, I'll give you a very provisional answer, but the, the honest answer is I, I, I cannot say with any degree of certainty. Okay. Um, you know, I think it was Popper who, who criticized Freud very heavily on this point and the notion that um, psychoanalysis is not scientific, that it, it can never be disproved. It, it always has a some sort of fallback position where it were out to make some sort of claim about your psychology and you were to deny it. I would then always fall back to the notion of, well, you're exhibiting resistance. This is, this yeah, is a yeah. classic theory. So you're sort of in a situation where, you know, once I diagnose you, it's quite difficult to undiagnose yourself within the <laughs> theoretical edifice. Um, I think that Jung aspired to a scientist. He certainly, cons you know, he was, a, he was a medical doctor. He was a psychiatrist. Um, and he certainly considered himself to be a scientist and he aspired to a scientific approach. Um, but, but how much... You know how much the empirical data influenced him and and helped him to refine his theory is a question that is very um, hotly debated in the field, uh, and, and it's a difficult one to answer. You know the, the nature of psychoanalysis, the science of the psyche, if you will, uh, particularly in in the field of depth psychology, doesn't seem to submit itself to the same sort of empirical and and data based evidence that, that we have in the hard sciences and the physical sciences. So although it aspires to a scientific approach, and it is a theory that constantly seeks to refine itself, how close it adheres to uh, science as defined by the philosophy of science or as defined by hard scientists is a, is a debatable question. Sure. Well, I suppose when you say hard scientists, I think we commonly assume that we, we're talking there about um, scientific naturalism. But I mean, for instance, he wasn't afraid of private experience or material from cultural or religious traditions. I mean, didn't he arguably try to convince scientific naturalists that phenomena as remote from publicly verifiable, re reproducible proof as the unconscious or, or the archetypes should be taken seriously in scientific terms? I don't know if he achieved yes. that, but he, he tried, didn't he? He certainly did. He certainly did. And... and uh... He, he made, I mean, I would say he made a very significant contribution in that sense, but whether that contribution or how widely that contribution has been assimilated into uh, even the humanities, let's not even talk about uh, scientific naturalism, even the humanities, even uh, uh, social studies, anthropological studies, 
is, uh, I would say, still an open question. Yeah. Perhaps uh, Jung has not yet fully come into his own in that sense. But I would agree with you that he he did aspire to gift this work to the natural scientific community and to make a contribution through his research and through his yeah, through his writing. How successful he was, I don't know. Okay, uh, let's, moving on then. Um, now, an aspect of Jung's work that I know that you're particularly interested in. We, we in the, the Middle Way Society feel arguably the biggest contribution to our understanding of the Middle Way made by Jung is the, is the concept of individuation. Could you tell us something about that, and first of all, and how that relates to your own experience? I would say the concept of individuation is, is, well, it's certainly central to Jung's work. It's perhaps amongst his most central ideas, yeah. certainly amongst his most central aspirational ideas. Could you actually, again, for the layperson, could you just give a quick snapshot of what individuation is as well? I, I, will, I will endeavor to do so. <laughs> so individuation is the concept that, that our psychologies possess, each, each, each individual psychology has a unique idiosyncratic uh, structure and telos. And individuation is the process of uh, increasingly exploring that uniqueness and those points of difference so that the individual psychology is increasingly differentiated from the mass mind, from the collective, and an individual path is explored. And ideally, it has as, at, its, at, its, at its notion as well that the individuation process is, a, is, a, is the pursuit of the ideal path for the individual. In other words, a life path or an expression of the individual that is most ideally suited to their own peculiar, uh, particular, and idiosyncratic psychology. Okay, and then, so, to paraphrase that, are we saying our experience comprises a variety of energies, symbols, and beliefs that may be in conflict and individuation is about reconciling them, bringing them into, re them to an extent with this idea of, of progress. Yes, I think that's a fair statement, Barry. I think that's certainly a very important element of, of the individuation process. So the, this idea of, uh, to put it in perhaps into, into Jungian terms, this idea of, of seeking wholeness, of, uh, of seeking to heal uh, the fragmentation of the psyche. So this understanding that the psyche naturally has opposing uh, polar positions that are seemingly in conflict with one another. Yeah. And the process of individuation, as you say, would be the process of, of reconciling, of bringing these opposite positions into some sort of coexistence, some sort of relationship. And most significantly, without collapsing one or other of the polar opposites, so that, uh, that, that the, the, this consciousness, for example, for Jung then, is the, is the facing of opposites, where they face one another. That, that for him is an expression of consciousness. And of course, consciousness is a central element of individuation. So one brings in the, um, the explicit position, the, the conscious position, as it were, and reconciles this to the implicit or unconscious position, that is possibly in conflict with the explicit conscious position, um, but without denying one or other side, so without throwing the baby out of the bathwater, so to speak. Sure. So, so could you give us a, a, a practical example of individuation that, that you know someone could attempt in you know in, a, in, in their everyday lives, or maybe in a, uh, something that from your own experience? I would say that. A very practical example or, or, or an accessible example is this idea of a, a quality or a, a personality trait that the individual finds to be undesirable for one or another reason. However, notwithstanding the fact that it is judged and seen as undesirable, it continues to persist. You know, there's this cliche, what you resist persists, but there's a truth in it from a psychoanalytic perspective. Yeah. And so, a, 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 an exercise in, in, in individuation would be instead of uh, resisting or opposing this seemingly undesirable characteristic or trait, that one seeks to find expression for it in your life in such a way that it is 
that it, it adds value uh, or it reconciles itself to the sort of meta-ethical position of the individual. But that, that act of reconciliation, that act of compromise, if you will, is not all one-way traffic. So it's not the simplistic idea that I, I redeem my negative characteristics uh, by making them, them good and, and, and polite and pure and, and uh, respectable, so to speak. It's that I, uh, I need to face that in myself which I've deemed to be undesirable. And there needs to be a reconciliation between both the conscious and unconscious positions such that both are altered through that engagement. But in simple terms then, that I need to take the fact that this quality lives in me, going back to your question, I need to take the fact that this quality lives in me seriously. And I need to engage with it seriously. I need to treat it with, res with a certain respect, with a certain reverence. Yeah. And in so doing, enter into a dialogue with it and seek to include it in my life in one or other way in which it can be expressed rather than being suppressed or repressed. Okay. So this, this obviously has huge implications beyond the medical model of psychotherapy. For example, perhaps as the basis of moral objectivity. Um, you know, that in the sense that the more, uh, I'm going to use the term integrated, because that's maybe the verb that goes within individuation. The more in integrated our judgments are, the more objective they are likely to be. To what extent would you agree with that? Yes, I think that would be consistent with with Jung and certainly uh, with Jung definitely and also psychoanalytic theory in the sense that if if by integration you mean conscious, you see, I would say that you're using this term integration, but perhaps that's interchangeable with this notion of making unconscious content conscious. So the more integrated it is, the the less biased or prejudiced my view would be, and presumably the greater access I would have to objectivity simply because the less distorted my lens is going to be. Yeah. So I would think that would be a fair statement. I think that would be consistent with psychoanalytic theory, yes. Yeah. Could it be also seen as taking, within the, the limitations of our physicality and our psyche, uh, taking into, uh, into account as much as realistically possible when we're making a judgment? Could that be congruent with what we're talking about? Yes, I think that's fair. I would... I would, I would maybe phrase it like this from the Jungian perspective that I think is consistent with what you're saying. It's a slightly different phrasing. It's the notion that when I'm looking at, when I'm considering any situation, um, typically I will adopt a particular perspective. So if I'm, if I'm considering a new enterprise, if I'm considering a relationship, or I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the values of one or other situation, um, usually there's a default ideological uh, position that it's good or bad or uh, that it should be done or it shouldn't be done or it's going to have a positive or a negative outcome or whatever it may be. And the good Jungian practice there would be to consider the opposite, to consider what the alternative is to one's ideological position. That, look, perhaps this, uh, there may be some profit in this enterprise. This enterprise may bring, uh, may be of some value to the community, to the, to, 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 to the country, whatever it may be. But at what price does it come? What what is its shadow? To put it in a Jungian sense, that yeah. it always it always carries it always carries in its ambit an opposite. Uh, nothing is one-sided. For Jung, one-sidedness was sort of a hallmark of the unconscious of barbarism. So I mean, you're speaking about a kind of a plural perspective, um, a, a sort of a multifaceted perspective. But but just in, in to put it into a Jungian frame, it's, I would say that one looks at the opposite of one's ideological or one's conscious position and tries to consider both of these aspects informing one's judgment as opposed to taking a kind of a narrow one-sided approach. Yeah. Well, that relates very much to our, the, our middle way perspective in that, in that sense. We have a, a preference, if, if, um, maybe for the term integration rather than individuation, even though we're talking about the same thing, mainly because we feel this makes it clear that integration is not only the process of psychological development in an individual, but it can also be applied at a social level. I, I, I don't know, what are your thoughts on that and the ethical and political, potential ethical and political applications of integration in general? Yes, I, I, I mean, I like that, and I think integration is, 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 a, is a useful term, not only in, in, in terms of the work and, that, that you're involved in with the middle way society. Um, but also from, from the psychological perspective. So, so certainly in terms of the individual, 
the, the process of individuating is a process of integration, of integrating diverse aspects of self, of integrating um, aspects that have been denied previously, of integrating unconscious aspects. And I think your comparison to the social s sphere, um, for me, it resonates. And I, and I would say that, yes, if one looks at the if one looks at the collective, if one looks at society as um, as displaying, in some sense, characteristics that are not entirely different from the individual, that the greater the capacity of the society, of the community, to integrate different perspectives, to integrate aspects of the society that may be marginalized, or may be denied, one would certainly imagine that that society's ability to function um, optimally and in, in, in a healthy way and ideally would be increased. I mean, I guess that one has to look at it as an aspirational process. I mean, uh, yeah. it's, it's a never-ending process because, of course, you know, it, it's perhaps a continuum rather than a destination. But yes, I do think that the process of integration is, um, is one that, 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 that ultimately le leads to the growth of that community. Yeah, and again, another resonant concept that you expressed there was this idea of through individuation or integration, there are no final goals that you are on this continuum. But um, I, I very much relate to that. Absolutely. I mean, if, when we talk about even, you know, when we talk about this notion of individuation, if we understand the notion of individuation, we, we, it would be a misnomer or a, or a misconception um, to think of an individual as individuated. It's a process of individuating naturally. Yeah. As long as one is alive and, and one, one uh, uh, puts oneself to the job at hand, one applies oneself to this project, one is presumably in the process of individuating. It's a lifelong process rather than a, a goal or a destination. Yeah, great. Okay. And then for us, um, Jung's other huge contribution, well, to the middle way, we feel is the, is the development of the concept of archetypes. Now. Now, my understanding, and there's been a lot of confusion about how archetypes should be interpreted. Could we try and unpack that a little bit? And, and, and I'd be interested to hear what your take is, is on their importance and value, especially, especially from a practical perspective. Of course, a very central idea in, in, in Jung's work and, and in Jungian psychology. Um, I think one, one cannot really understand Jung's work without understanding the notion of archetypes that the, the psyche is not only individual, but it has this universal objective uh, or collective uh, aspect to it. And that uh, each individual, each individual psychology, each individual's expression is an individual and particular expression of a universal or an archetypal, uh, or in Jungian terms, archetypal form. So, um, so certainly you know, archetypes are, are central to the theory. Um, and in terms of its implication, well, its implication is that everything that I may be or you may be grappling with as individuals are not only our individual destiny, it's not only our individual burden or challenge or our individual puzzle to be solved, but it also has this universality to it. It has this objectivity to it that transcends our individual uh, destinies and our individual psyches. And so then one starts to understand that cultural narratives, fable, mythologies, literature, uh, the arts, are all sources that one can draw on in terms of seeking to find expression uh, it's seeking to find inspiration, sorry, in terms of the, the challenges that, that each individual is facing because each individual ultimately is part of a collective, is part of an objective continuum. And so what, what we are dealing with is, is only in part personal, yeah. that it has this universal objective root. And if we are willing to take the time to study um, history, to study uh, literature, to study the various cultural gifts that we've been given, that one will almost invariably find in one form or another the, the challenge that, that we as individuals are grappling with. And so that's the, that's the idea, that, um, that, that each of our lives has not only a personal, but it has a universal character, and that we can 
and appreciate that that parameterizes us, it, it encloses us within a certain structure. Our freedom is not absolute. But at the same time, it offers us the comfort and the, uh, the possibility of drawing on the experience of others that have come before us and those around us in terms of trying to understand what it is that we are dealing with as individuals. Sure, yeah. Um, just going back to what you were saying right at the beginning of the talk, uh, Stephen, that it provided you, Jungian psychology provided you with a useful language. I'm thinking from my own experience with archetypes, that how they've been helpful is that, you know, maybe you might be really pissed off with someone at work, your boss or something, and then you, you, you've got this sort of shadow view of them like a, you know, a bastard or whatever you want. And, uh, and there's a projection going on of this archetype. And, you know, when you catch yourself doing that, then you can recognize that you're seeing only a very partial view of that person. And I found that very helpful. Does that make sense to you? Uh, no, oh, quite. I'm sure, of course, there's the notion of projection that, that what I see out there ultimately is an aspect of my own soul, is an aspect of my own psyche. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and that it, it's subjectively distorted. I mean, going back to what you're saying, that, that through the process of integrating those projections, for example, this is the kind of the path to psychological wholeness and healing. But yes, certainly the, the recognition that what I see out there and what I'm grappling with, in some sense, is always an aspect of myself. Sure, yeah. That. And um, I think the other thing that I find very practically helpful is is because they allow us to distinguish between meaningful symbols that are found, as you say, universally because of their psychic function and metaphysical truths or arguably ab absolute. So, so God, for example, can be very meaningful to a person in an archetypal experiential sense without that person having to believe in God. Yes, yes, that's, that's nicely put, Barry. Yeah, so, so, I mean, Jung puts it very nicely there. I mean, this was, of course, a very big issue for him, and he grappled with this, his, let's say, throughout his whole life and certainly throughout his whole career. And it's this notion that God, for example, is an absolute reality in the sense that God is a psychic reality. Whether or not there is a meta metaphysical presence in the cosmos or in, in creation of, of something that we may term God is, as you say, a metaphysical presupposition, which uh, it seems that uh, it's very difficult to verify one way or another. But what we can verify, what we do have access to, is the symbol, as you put it, it the archetype, the fact that God is a psychic uh, reality and it lives in our psyches. Um, and, 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 and sorry, let me say that, that he lives in our psyches, assuming one's view of God is masculine, of course. Um, and, and that, is a, that is a psychic truth. That is a, a phenomenological truth, yeah. uh, to put it in, in, in book sense. So, yes, uh, uh, that, that's a nice point. I, I really like what you're saying there, that, that symbols and archetypes have a reality independent of their metaphysical basis. Yeah, it's like, it's like reading a, you know, a fairy story by the Brothers Grimm. You know, those, those stories can be incredibly mean, meaningful, and they're, they're, those archetypes can have real power without, without obviously believing in... In, in the Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yes. Yes. So, so one, 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 one can be liberated from the literal truth. That's one, one, one recognizes that there's a psychic truth, a symbolic truth that is independent from the literal historical truth of the narrative. Yeah. Yeah. And can be dealt with, yeah, independently and very usefully in that way. Yeah. What was it? He said something that I, I don't believe in God, but I know God or something. I, can't remember the actual. Yeah, the wonderful, wonderful story. Uh, interview with John Freeman on Face to Face to, towards towards the end of his life when Jung was a very old man, and Freeman asks him, Doctor Jung, after all these years, after all the study, you know, do you now believe in God? And <laughs> Jung answered, he said, Well, it's a difficult question to answer um, because I no longer need to believe. I know that God exists. And then, and then, not in the interview, but later on, in, a, in, in I think in the statesman, he went on to qualify it by saying that naturally, what he meant was that at least God exists as a psychic truth. Yeah. So it was meaningful to him. Yes. Yes. Meaningful, and, and, and not only meaningful, but real. It, it, it yeah. has a yeah. real, substantial existence when viewed psychically or phenomenologically, and we have to see that as separate from, let's say, some sort of material or ontological or metaphysical. Um, true. Yeah, and this this ties in very much with I don't know if you've come across this personally, Stephen, but embodied meaning theory, that we have um, we actually have these metaphors and 
uh, archetypes actually hardwired into our neural circuitry. You know, the, the god archetype, and you know, I'm sure. I, ha I haven't come across that. I mean, I'm, I'm not familiar with the work or the field, but but certainly, of course, that's completely consistent and resonant with uh, Jungian theory in terms of um, what was what, what did you refer to? Embodied. Uh, it's in embodied meaning theory by um, by Lakoff and Johnson. I'll um, I'll send you the link. <laughs> That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. That's okay. Um, right. Uh, Jungian ideas and practices have by and large been associated with within the medical model of psychoanalysis and therapy. However, the goal of the, your center, the center of applied Jungian studies, is to make Jungian psychology accessible to all. So I was just wondering if you could tell us something about the center, how it was set up, and, and how Jungian practices can be helpful to everybody, and, and also how the center tries to realize these objectives. I think Jungian psychology has uh, a fairly unique characteristic in that although Jung himself was a psychiatrist and although he worked with um, mentally ill and mentally distressed patients, uh, it, it ultimately is a psychology that is not tied to pathology. It is not, it is not, it doesn't have as its central focus the treatment of pathology. Um, it rather has as its central focus this, this process that we've been speaking about of, of individuation, um, of, of self-realization, perhaps, to use a, an Eastern term. Yeah. And so, in that sense, then, Jungian psychology has a value that extends way beyond clinical practice, way beyond the treatment of pathology. And the, the way that I personally encountered Jung's work, as I mentioned earlier on, was outside of a clinical environment. I mean, subsequently, I have, um, you know, spent many years in, you know, working with clinicians, working with Jungian analysts, just to kind of ensure that my understanding of the theory is is um, what I'd like to believe it is. But but you said, but, but 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 the way I encountered it was outside of the clinical environment, and the way that we teach it is outside of the clinical environment, in the belief that Jung's work is goes beyond pathology, goes beyond the treatment of sickness. Yeah. Um, it is, a, it is a treatment for the soul, as it were, and it is something about enabling and facilitating this process of becoming, uh, of individuating and of integrating these diverse aspects of ourselves and ultimately realizing um, the, the sort of the, the, the fullest and optimal expression of ourselves in the world. So that idea has informed uh, the, the, you know, that has informed the work that we do in the center. The center was, was formalized about five years ago. Um, when I returned from uh, the University of Essex after I did my master's degree. And um, we are geographically based in, in South Africa, in Johannesburg, and we teach real-world courses in South Africa. But we now have a, a fairly substantial um, global community of students. And these are people from all walks of life. There's, some of them are in the psychotherapeutic field, but they're certainly not limited to the psychotherapeutic field, that seek to use Jung's work as a model, as a, as a theory, if you want, uh, in, in which to understand themselves better and in which to um, individuate. Okay. We see um, integration stroke individuation in, in some ways as, as the middle way inside out. And, and by that I mean rather than just avoiding dogmatic beliefs on either side, integration brings together experiential beliefs and energies that at first were unnecessarily opposed. Each supports the other because it's, it's only by avoiding metaphysical beliefs that cannot be integrated that we, that we can uh, make integration possible. Now, I don't know what your understanding, if any of the middle way is, but, um, well, what, what is your understanding in, in the middle way if you've got one and how does it to relate to what I just said there and what we've been talking about in general? Look, I, I apologize in advance if my understanding is somewhat simplistic. So That's I'll, fine. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just express it to the very best of my ability. Um, I, I, I mean, my, my understanding, I think, is, is probably consistent with what I said earlier on, that essentially one is seeking to avoid, uh, in the middle way, one is seeking to avoid a polarized, dogmatic, uh, and, and concretized sort of fundamentalist uh, position. And one is keeping oneself open to, not only to the opposite, but to the possibilities of evolution, of change, 
of refinement, of, of new learning. Um, but I particularly liked what, I won't try to repeat what you said, but I particularly liked what you said just now about, sorry, sorry, Barry, can you give me one moment? Is it possible? I've got two dogs in here. I just need to get rid of, get no rid of them. I'm going to come across on your... Out, out. My apologies for the interruption. No, was that the animus? That, that was the <laughs> that was the animus, yes. <laughs> Two of them. <laughs> so, uh, so I'll go, let's go back to this. So, 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 go, so, picking up on on your idea of of integration and and of how opposites can in fact support each other and and avoid a. I mean, I, I mean, I don't know if you use this idea of a metaphysical collapse, but certainly avoid a an ideological or an ethical or a the collapse of a position. I really like that. That um, that th there's a value in, in in the tension of opposites, to put it in a Jungian sense. That yeah. one that that consciousness is about holding the tension of opposites. And although there, there's a tremendous desire to to slip into, because there's a comfort in in, in, in having an absolute belief or having a one-sided position. Yeah. That this evolution of consciousness requires us to hold the middle way, as you put it. So. That, that, that would be my understanding. Um, I, I'm not sure you'll tell me how sort of close it is. Or That sounds pretty good to me, Stephen. Um, Jungian, this Jungian process, would you say that it has a sort of dialectical uh, element to it? Very much so, yes. I would say it is a, I would say it is a dialectical process. Um, some, there's been some fascinating work done by um, the Jungian scholar, very prominent Jungian, very controversial, but very prominent Jungian scholar, uh, an analyst Wolfgang Gigerich uh, around this this dialectical approach, but I would say that he articulates what is a, a perhaps an unspoken truth in 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 Jungian's analysis and 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 Jungian, uh, Jung, Jung's approach to psychology, and that yes, that consciousness is and this individuation process is most definitely a dialectical in character. That that the very character of consciousness in Jungian psychology is dialectical. So I would say that that is uh, yes. I would I would strongly agree with that position. Okay. And my last question, uh, Stephen, it's just a practical one, really. If people wanted to find out more about your work and the centre in terms of uh, websites or gaining access to it, how, how would they go about it? Yes, they can find us on the web. Um, the URL is very simple: appliedjung.com. And then uh, on social media, we have a fairly big um, presence on Facebook. And that is Facebook forward slash Applied Jung. So very simple, AppliedJung.com or, fa or Facebook forward slash Applied Jung. You can go to our Facebook page or to our website and, uh, and there, you know, if you, if, you know, follow us, like our page or subscribe to our newsletter and uh, we'll keep you updated with, with what we're doing and what's coming out. Great. Okay. Well, it's been really um, fascinating talking to you, Stephen, and uh, you know, and good luck with the centre and everything. I think you know, I think I think it's great what you're doing. Um, thanks, thanks for giving up your time to talk to me. It's a great pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me, Barry, and all the best with your work. And I look forward to talking to you again sometime. Smash it. You can find out more about Middleway Philosophy at www.middlewaysociety.org.